You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 19. This week on the show, we forge ahead with our duck profile segment and feature the American Widgeon, and then we talk about hunting the late freeze and give you some tips on how to handle that late season ice. All right, welcome to this week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We would like to thank you for making us part of your day. However you are listening to us, we certainly appreciate it. Joining me this week on the show, as he always does, is my good friend, Dan Harushka. Dan, how are you? I'm doing pretty well, trying to stay dry. We're getting a a good uh, constant rain right now, and then it's going to turn into a freeze, which we're going to be talking about. So it's going to be down in the teens and single digits here for the next the next week coming and uh, just a weird weird season weather wise and especially in january getting constant rain and 50 degrees here is just unheard of yeah the, the weather's been strange and you know we're going to get into a bunch of stuff dealing with weather and how to hunt different conditions and things like that in the show but before we get too far into that i wanted to just sort of review some of the ways that you can uh, talk to us here at the show there's a multitude of ways to do it uh, the first is you can reach us at hpoutdoors.com. If you would like to uh, talk with us via Facebook and Twitter, we're active on both of those sites. And our exclusive HP Outdoors Facebook group is now active. So if you would like to be a member of that, all you have to do is just search us on Facebook and you know request uh, access to the show and we'll, we'll grant you that. And really the group is just designed for HP Outdoors listeners who uh, want to talk waterfowl hunting and you know, talk questions and strategies and share stories and things like that. Just a way to sort of continue the discussion when the podcast is not ongoing. Um, you know, meet other folks that are listening to the show and Dan and I will be active in there talking as well. So just another way to kind of touch base with everybody. You can also find all of our episodes on iTunes, uh, all of the old episodes that we've got and our new episodes are published through iTunes every Monday. And um, if you've had an opportunity to uh, go on there, if you like what you hear, uh, we would love you to leave us a five-star rating and review. And thank you to the uh, 25 or so of you that have already done that. Uh, we really do appreciate it. A couple other things we have as well is we've uh, recently rolled out our HP Outdoors listener survey, which is your opportunity to provide us some feedback about you know who you are and what you'd like us to cover and, and all of that sort of thing. You can find that on our website as well as on our Facebook page. And as well at both of those locations, you can sign up for the HP Outdoors newsletter that we are going to be a little bit more active with here uh, as we roll into 2015, um, basically providing you updates and uh, some things about the show and just good information, you know, that the waterfowl hunter would enjoy. So again, I've said this a couple different times. It's not going to be something that we're going to use to spam your inbox and that sort of thing, but just another way for us to sort of um, continue to build the, uh, you know, the relationship with, uh, with all of the listeners that we have. So all of that is good stuff, as well as um, you have at your disposal the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Hotline at 724-609-FOWL, 724-609-3695. And this week, we're actually going to be featuring a question from one of our listeners that called in through the hotline. And, um, you know, we get a lot of, we get a lot of uh, calls and questions through that hotline, but this one in particular, I thought, was really kind of a... Uh, you know, a legitimate question that I think a lot of people probably wonder about. And, uh, we thought it was a good one to, uh, to share with everybody here on the show. Um, you know, I, the, before we get into the question, Dan, I know that, you know, a lot of new hunters, you know, are listening to the show and, and, you know, the, maybe their first season are just kind of getting started. So we picked this question particularly because we think that a lot of guys might be in the same type of boat, but, um, you know, what do you think? Do you feel that this is probably one of the more common things that a new hunter, new hunter will run into? I think so. And even like, I'm, I'm thinking about going to any of the stores around here, unless you go to Cabela's or, you know, Bass Pro Shops, but a lot of the sporting goods stores around here are limited in their decoy selection. And most of it is, you know, the, the teal or the woodies and mallards. And, you know, you don't really, um, they don't, they just don't have the variety that, that you need in late season, I would say, you know, the, some of the birds get here later and, 
unless you're shopping online, you know, for a, a new guy to go out and just hit his, his local shop, he's going to be buying what they have. So, um, yeah, you know, I think, I think a lot of people are probably running into this and I'm sure that there's many different opinions on what to do. So, yeah, and we're certainly going to share our opinions on how to handle the situation and we're going to get that into that in just one moment. But before we do, I uh, just wanted to sort of lay out everything that we're going to cover here this week. We are obviously going to have our, our listener question that uh, has been submitted to us. And we're going to follow that up with, um, you know, our duck profile segment that we've been doing here for a couple different for a couple weeks now. And we're going to feature the American Widgeon. And then, um, you know, after that, we're going to get into something that, you know, hopefully most people by this time of the year are starting to think about. And if you're maybe even experiencing some of it, uh, Lord knows I wish I was at this time of year, but, um, you know, the weather has not cooperated, but that's hunting the late freeze and what to do when, you know, backwaters are icing up and things are getting cold and, you know, you got to have to change your tactics a little bit and sort of, uh, you know, adjust what you've been doing now that some of your water has been shut off. So we're going to talk a little bit about hunting the late freeze and what you need to do to be successful when things start icing up. And I know, you know, Dan, I mean, we hunted the late freeze a little bit in the early season this year in November, it got cold and, you know, there was some ice to be had and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, typically by this time of year, you know, I know up your way, you're usually battling, you know, some blocked up areas, right? Yeah. Usually it's, it's all frozen over. And we've had a couple of times where, you know, shallower water is frozen up. Um, you know, a couple of the lakes around the edges right now are froze, but, uh, today's in the forties and tomorrow's in the fifties with rain both days. So it's going to open back up, but then it's coming right back with, you know, really chilling weather. So, uh, this is a, a perfect time for this episode for sure. At least around here, I know some of, you know, the Midwest guys are already battling that up North. So, um, it's a, it's a good, good little discussion we have here. Yeah. And, and one of the, I mean, one of the biggest challenges with this, when I was, you know, thinking about this episode was there are a lot of different elements to dealing with hunting, you know, late season and, and ice and frozen water and that kind of stuff. It all depends on the type of duck you're hunting and your geese and that kind of stuff. So we're going to try to dabble into a little bit of that stuff, but for the most part, these are going to be just kind of general things that you need to, you know, know and be aware of when you're hunting these type of conditions. So that's going to be a really good discussion that we're going to get to here and a little bit later in the show, but let's go ahead and get started with uh, this week's, um, you know, content and, uh, we're going to let you guys uh, share for the first time on the show, um, the a listener question submitted by Justin Mullins from uh, Southeast Ohio. Uh, Justin's got a really good question that I think a lot of guys probably run into, especially if you're just getting started into waterfowl hunting or maybe don't have a lot of decoys and that kind of stuff. And then he also asked a question in the second half of this that's we've touched on a little bit on, you know, on this show. And Dan and I have been pretty clear about how we stand on this, but we're going to visit it one more time because it's a valid point And, um, you know, I think something that you know, certainly took us a couple seasons to sort of get comfortable with, you know, um, our, our approach to that method. So we're going to tackle both of those things here after you get a chance to listen to this question, uh, submitted by you, the listeners to the HP Outdoors podcast. Hey guys, uh, Justin Mullins here from Southeast Ohio. Um, got a couple questions for you. Um, one would be, um, hunting late season. I know some wood ducks and teal green wing mostly would be gone at, at this time. But I was wondering if we could still use those decoys kind of as a confidence decoy to maybe try to get these birds to commit better. Also, my second would be, what is the best all-around duck or goose load to use if you're expecting both birds? Keep up the great work, and good luck, guys, and have a happy new year. Okay. Well... As you heard, we'd like to thank Justin for submitting the sh uh, his question to the show. If you would like to have a, a question aired on the show, you can give us a call at 724-609-FOWL, 724-609-3695. And again, all that is is a, a voicemail box that you can call into. And um, basically, you know, if you have a question, you can just record it into there and, and hang up. And, you know, you don't really have to talk to us or anything to do it. Um, but, you know, the thing I you know, I'd mentioned to everybody is, if you're going to do that and you'd like us to use it on the show, just make sure you're in a good, you know, you got good cell phone reception, good audio quality so that, so that it's good enough. You know, you speak clearly into the phone so that we can use it, which, uh, as you can tell, Justin did a fine job there. So thank you to him for uh, interacting with the show. And we encourage everybody else, if you've got questions or things you want us to tackle, um, doing it through the hotline is, a, is an outstanding opportunity for you guys to have your voice heard on the HP Outdoors podcast. So, um, okay, Dan, what do you think? Uh, late season. Is it still okay to use your wood duck and teal decoys to kind of add numbers and confidence, that kind of thing, uh, you know, to your late season birds, even though 
that species of duck is probably pushed out of your area. I kind of have two thoughts on it. My first thought goes back to what we always talk about, and that's scouting and trying to replicate what you're seeing. Um, you know, sometimes if you're if you're out there and you know the the woodies have been gone for two months, it, it just might really throw them off. But on the other hand, if you're checking, you know, migration apps or you know general discussion forums about that you might really be surprised because I've, you know, <clears throat> like I was saying before here, it was December and guys around here were still saying that they were seeing woodies out. So I haven't seen them around, but that would make me, you know, think twice about taking some wood duck decoys out. So it's really kind of a difficult situation, but I think I would go back to scouting and really seeing what is around and even on your days off, go out and see what's flying and and just try and replicate that. You know, I, I I would add one thing to that. Um, I can see how this is an issue for a lot of guys, especially that are first getting started. You know, maybe this was your first year hunting waterfowl, and you know you did a little bit of scouting, or you, you know you saw that there was wood ducks in the area and teal in your area. Perfect. So you go out and you pick up a dozen, you know, six of each, maybe something like that, or whatever. And you know you're hunting those, and and then it's though that's fine in the early season and then those birds push out and all of a sudden you're seeing a different type of duck and now you're kind of thinking to yourself well this is what i got so this is what i'm going to throw out you know and then the first time you know a flock of ducks flares your spread you're probably thinking well is, is it because i'm using the wrong type of decoy or anything like that so i think that this could be a legitimate question for a lot of guys as you mentioned my general rule of thumb would be um you know replicate what you see in your area and if you're not seeing wood ducks and teal don't use the decoys um Having said that, could you kill ducks over them? Yeah, I don't know, probably. You know, I'm not going to rule that out. But what I would say is if you have to use those decoys because, you know, you don't have the means to get any more, you don't have a buddy that has anything different or anything like that, for whatever reason, you need to use them, I would tend to use the hens first. Uh, and the reason for that is because, you know, your hen decoys tend to give you a little more leeway. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes a, a juvenile or a first year drake of some, you know, some types of ducks looks a little more of a henish type, maybe not fully plumed, all that kind of stuff. So you might be able to get away with using your hens a little bit more. I would probably really try to steer clear of the the wood ducks and the vibrant colors that they're, they have on those you know, drake decoys, unless you're seeing those in your area. In, in, in Ohio, probably a good chance you're not seeing a ton of wood ducks. I would tend to steer away from the drakes. But having said that, it doesn't mean that if you throw them out there, you're not going to kill ducks. I don't think there's a definitive answer, you know, right or wrong way. There's a lot of gray area when you're talking decoys and that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's sort of my general gut instinct on that. But, you know, if someone listening to this show has a has more experience with this or has a uh, different, um, you know, different philosophy on this, feel free to reach out to us and we'll certainly uh, pass the message on and uh, help Justin get squared away the best we can. So the second part of his question, Dan, he was talking to us about, you know, duck loads and goose loads. And, you know, this is one that I've seen a lot of guys struggle with. You know, they, they've they got two boxes of shells out there. They got their double B's for their geese and they got a box of fours in the blind for the ducks. And they're trying to switch in and out. And they're like, well, I'll put in, you know, two shells of fours. And then my last one will be a double B. So it'll give me a little longer range, knockdown power and all that kind of stuff. Um, you and I have talked about this several times on the show, but for anyone that has missed it in the past, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what uh, what our philosophy is on on waterfowl loads? One of my New Year's resolutions, non waterfowl, is to get more organized. And I know you know you're you love being organized, but my truck, if you look at it, is it's Ooh, it's just tough. it's, That's a tough it's like a lady. locker room. <laughs> but if I need anything, it's all in there. But <clears throat> what I was gonna say is, um, I think it was two years ago I bought a Drake vest that you know has like i don't know how many pockets for for ammo in it but i actually pulled it out today because i'm trying to get stuff organized and i started taking shells out of it i mean it was packed with shells so i started looking at it and it ranges from triple b's to number four shot and i was just thinking to myself if that was in my blind bag and ducks came in and i you know, I, I was loaded up with triple B or, you know, or T shot or, you know, that's just not the situation I want to be in. So, you know, 
I think both of us have pretty much simplified down to just shooting number twos. And I can't think of any situation where I have questioned that move. Yeah, I for for me, you know, the first time we we caught wind of this was when we were hunting down on the eastern shore with the, uh, you know, the guys that we hunt with down there, and they told us they use number twos, you know, all year long, and since that time, I've used number twos from September all the way through mid February when the season goes out here for late season honkers, and never once have I felt that I was in a disadvantage one way or the other. Um, I just I think that it's right there in the sweet spot. Um, I don't like carrying multiple loads in the, in my blind bag or in my gun or any of that kind of stuff. I keep it as simple as I possibly can. And in order to do that, number two is the closest thing that, you know, we can do, um, on both sides of that. And, uh, I mean, like I said, the proof is there. I, you know, you're not, you have no problem knocking down ducks, have no problem knocking down geese. Um, now again, everybody might not be comfortable with that scenario. Um, but for me, I'm comfortable with it. I think general rule of thumb is if you're not going to do that, you know, if you're hunting honkers later in the year, you want a little bit more, you know, double B's, triple B's, that kind of stuff. Again, if you're shooting decoying birds, feet down in your decoys, number twos will, will take them down all day long. No, no problems there. I guarantee it. So, um, that's how we stand on it. If you you know, if anyone else out there has another way that they approach it or like, uh, you know, method or philosophy that they have, we'd love to hear it. Definitely would share it. Uh, but for Dan and I, it's number twos all day long. So, um, again, thank you to Justin for calling the show. And uh, we really appreciate him uh, bringing those questions to the table. And if you have something that you'd like to volunteer for the show, again, the number that you can do that at is 724-609-FOWL, 724-609-3695. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and um, forge on here to our duck profile segment this week and a little bit shorter than what it's been, um, but we're going to feature the American Widgeon this week. And um, I can't say that I got a ton of experience shooting Widgeon. Um, I have shot a few, but um, I don't, you know, we really don't get them super heavy here in this area, but um, I know that there certainly are places where they get really good Widgeon shoots and I'm often jealous of those folks. So. Let's go ahead and uh, roll through this week's uh, duck profile segment. All right, the American Widgeon. The male and female are both about 20 inches long and both about 1.8 pounds. Uh, the male widgeons have a white patch from the forehead to the middle of the crown and an iridescent green band from the eye to the back of the head. They have a pinkish brown breast and sides that are separated from a black under undertail covert by white flank feathers. And in flight, there's a white shoulder patch that is pretty recognizable. And the legs and feet are blue gray to dark gray. And the female widgeons have a gray head with a brownish black crown and brownish chest and sides. And the legs and feet are also also a bluish bluish gray. And both the males and females have a bluish black tip bill. The breeding of the widgeon is almost the northernmost bird. And the only other dabbling duck that is more north than them would be the pintail. And they breed throughout Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, Alaska, and the Northwest Territories. And they prefer shallow lakes and marshes. And the female American widgeon lays an average of nine eggs. You know, the American widgeon... Uh, is one of the earliest waterfowl to reach their wintering grounds when it comes time to migrate. Uh, the widgeon that are in Alaska and sort of western Canada will migrate along the Pacific Flyway and basically winter around sort of the Puget, Puget Sound and into California areas. Birds that are using you know the Central Flyway will winter in sort of the Texas Panhandle and along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast of Mexico. Uh, the widgeons that are going to be in the Mississippi Flyway uh, basically depend on the wetlands and lakes in eastern Arkansas and western Tennessee, and, you know, which is providing them basically the vital wintering habitat that they need in that area. And um, you know, the widgeon in general will use a variety of different habitats, including sort of ponds and lakes, you know, some brackish marshes, things like that, basically areas with abundant uh, aquatic vegetation. And um, you know, they'll readily eat on grasses and you know, things in wet meadows and pastures and that kind of stuff. Uh, American widgeon are 
you know, they're, they're vacationers. They're very common in the winter to visit Central America, the Caribbean, Northern Colombia, Trinidad, occasionally all the way down to Venezuela. So uh, they like to get, you know, down there into the warm areas. Uh, the population for the Widgeon, 2014 survey calculated them at 3.1 million birds, which is about 18% up from the 2013 survey that had them at about 2.6 million birds. Um, basically, current numbers are approximately 20% above the long-term average for the Widgeon, which is uh, 2.6 million birds. So pretty clear the Widgeon is uh, doing quite well and thriving right now. You know, Dan, I, the, more, the longer we do these um, duck profile segments and the more I see information about Texas Panhandle, Louisiana, Gulf Coast, that kind of stuff, I think we need to get down there and hunt, man. It sounds like that's kind of where it's at when the migration's on. You tell me when. Tell me when. <laughs> Especially, I mean, you see you see the birds <laughs> just lined up and all the hero shots and, you know, I mean, we just, we don't get it here like like they do and... I mean, it's, you know, definitely some hunts that we need to go on. So um, I'll I'll pack up right next to you, buddy. Yeah, I mean, I just, I get super jealous when I see these, you know, hunts from the panhandle with just lines of uh, redheads and all that kind of stuff. You know, we're lucky if we get a redhead or two per season down here. Um, those guys down there, you know, shooting limits, you know, half the time they get out. But uh, anyway, another another great you know duck profile segment here this week, and uh, we'll be sure you, to bring you another one again next week. So let's go ahead and transition into the main portion of today's show, which is hunting the hard freeze. So normally this time of year, you know we're we're breaking ice and. Um, you know, finding open water and stuff like that to try to hunt right now. It's not a problem because our weather stinks and it's been warm and, um, haven't got that hard freeze, but typically this time of year, that's what you can count on. And that's what you're, you're hoping for. So we thought it would be valuable to sort of go through some things to consider when it becomes late in the year and cold and you're dealing with those type of conditions. And to start it off, I think the first thing for me would be, um, is just simply don't give up when it gets really cold and things are locking up, that's when the hunting can just turn on and be really good. But so many guys just give up when it's cold and it's late and you've been chasing them for a while and you're tired and, you know, life's got, got things going on where you're busy. But I promise you, if you stick it out and do the extra work to fight the ice, you can just have some of the greatest hunts you'll ever experience. So the first thing for me is just simply don't give up. I know, Dan, you know, you know, a lot of guys pack it in when it gets, when it gets too cold and that kind of stuff, but you know how important it is to, to, you know, how important it can be to fight through to that late season. Yeah. I mean, you have to have a positive attitude and, and, you know, 99% of the guys out there brag about being a waterfowl hunter. And it's not because you just wake up early because all the other hunters do that too. But, you know, getting out there and being out when it's, you know, negative, negative degrees with a wind chill and you're standing in ice water. Like that's, that's what makes us us. So, you know, don't give up. And, you know, I know it's really easy to, to stay in bed under the warm comforter next to the fire, but get out and get it done. I've, you know, I just feel like this is very, once it gets to this part of the season, it's almost like your veins, you know, it's very constricting, you know, cold wise, but also in where the birds are going, it almost, you can, it seems like you can pinpoint the birds a lot easier. You know, they can't always get into the, the back waters that, you know, you might not be able to get to, or, you know, the back end of the swamps and, you know, you, it's, sometimes it's a lot easier to find them and almost guarantee that they're going to be there when everything freezes up. So you can have some bang out hunts in times like this. Well, another thing too, guys will do is you know, you get used to hunting your handful of spots and your marshes and that kind of stuff. And then it gets cold and they lock up and guys will just say, eh, can't duck hunt anymore. Everything's locked up. Birds are moved on. It's not the case. Just because the water's frozen doesn't mean that they're gone. You just have to know where to look and you got to put a little more time in. First thing that I'm going to recommend that you do, and this is pretty common knowledge, but um, best thing to do, move to the big water. You know, you got to find open water because the birds are going to roost somewhere. You got to find 
where that is. And oftentimes it's going to be that biggest water because that's going to be the last thing to freeze up. So if you're driving back roads, looking at ponds and, you know, little sloughs and stuff like that, you're wasting your time. If that's all locked up, they're not going to be in there. You're not going to, you're not going to see them, you know, in that. So move to the big water, find where it's open and see what kind of ducks are there. You might have to change your, your approach a little bit. Um, if the majority of, you know, depending on this all depends on where you hunt, obviously the flyway that you're in, what the birds are like, but for our area, for example, when it gets late, a lot of times, you know, the, the dabblers are going to push out and we got to focus more on divers, you know, more of the ring neck type ducks, occasional redheads, canvas backs, that kind of stuff. You know, those are the birds that are going to be pushed into our area. Sometimes black ducks, that kind of stuff. But for, for, uh, you know, um, dabblers and, and things like that a lot of those birds push out so we have to change our strategies and, and things of where we hunt and how we hunt and that kind of stuff so you may have to change it up to to chase divers or something like that but you know i, I know i know dan you you've got some big water local to where you live and i know that you know exactly what i'm talking about when you're driving by you'll start seeing different types of ducks out on the lake when you see some of those backwaters freezing up yeah and it's it's almost like a punch to the gut this year because we got that cold snap and the birds such as the redheads and the canvas backs whenever they usually show up our season's out we can't hunt them so i mean my diver spread is obsolete i have you know no diver spread whatsoever because whenever they show up here our season has been out so this year we got that cold snap and then before you know it there's you know seven, 700 redheads out on the lake and you're just looking at them and, and thinking about, you know, how long are they going to stay here and, you know, how fast can I order them online? So, you know, I definitely know what you're talking about in that situation. And one of the, the biggest, uh, you know, sort of challenges is, is convincing yourself that it's okay to not target mallards every time you hunt. I know a lot of guys just get hung up on that. And I, again, I'm speaking to our area now. I mean, Certainly there's other flyways where this isn't the case, but for us, um, you know, you're going to have more success if, if, if you want to harvest ducks, then, then, you know, changing your, your focus a little bit more to the divers, but, um, that's something to certainly keep in mind. But if you have the ability to somehow to keep water open, you're going to be further ahead when everything else is locked up and that much is obvious, but that can be done a different, a couple different ways. You know, you can um, obviously show up morning of, break ice, move it out of the way, hunt that way. You can use ice eaters if you have the ability to keep them in ponds and keep them running and keep water open. If you're out on your boat, you can uh, drop the motor in the in the in the water and blow you know blow the water, uh, run the motor to help it clear out the ice. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but obviously you have to keep water open. It doesn't do you any good to break up break up ice, pitch out your decoys, and then an hour later everything's frozen in again. And, um, uh, you know, you're just, your ducks aren't moving, birds are circling. They don't see any water to land in that kind of thing. You got to keep the ice open regardless. Um, if you're going to be hunting in those, those types of situations. Um, I know Dan, you've got some experience breaking ice and you know, you deal with it a lot more than I deal with it down here in Virginia. Um, so maybe you can add a little bit more to that. Yeah. I was just going to throw some tips out. Um, when you're do when you're breaking ice, just a couple of things to think about. When you start, you're going to start on land, obviously. When, you, when you're when you stepping on ice, make sure that you step on top of it and try not to just forge through it. If that's the case, get yourself a hammer or, you know, a little hatchet or something like that because you don't want to cut your waders. And, you know, I can speak to that as well. You know, having full a uh, full boot of freezing cold water is going to ruin your day real quick. And also, when you're doing that... If you could think about it as trying to walk in a circle and keeping the ice chunks big, because if you just start smashing ice, then you're still, you're just going to have a bunch of broken ice in your hole. Try and keep it in large pieces and slide it underneath the other pieces of ice. That way you're going to have a big open hole. And, you know, like that, that late season freeze that we had last year, the late season hunt that we went on, it was very like a slushy just broken up ice. And I mean, there was obviously huge pieces of ice as well that we kept sliding underneath, but we're, I think we were on the downside wind and it just kept pushing all the slush on us and it was pretty miserable. And, you know, our decoys ended up just being piled up in ice and, uh, you know, we had some pass shooting, but as far as decoying, you definitely want open water for them to land in. And that 
feeds perfectly into my next point. When you're when you're hunting these conditions, you may not have a huge pocket of water to hunt. You may have just a small piece that you're able to keep open. So one of the best things you can do um, is downsize your spread a little bit and just use the most realistic you know decoys that you have and set them in tighter patterns you know a lot of guys in the early season stuff want to pitch their decoys out make them look real big spread them all out well if you see ducks in the late season a lot of times they're in tight because you know it might just be a little 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 piece of water that they all are in there trying to get in you know and use so it's not uncommon to see your um you know your diet you know your ducks in there packed in tight um and think about one other thing when you're when you're setting up your decoys and stuff like that you know, this is, this is typically the late season. This is usually the very end. Birds have come all the way down the flyway, depending on where you live, all that stuff, but they've been hunted. They've been shot at. They've seen decoys. They're, they're, they're weary. They're, you know, they're educated to some degree. They've seen all the tricks. So it's incumbent upon you to be as realistic as you possibly can, but also think outside the box and try to be different. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. But, um, you know, how you deploy your decoys and all that stuff is very, very important this time of year because sometimes, you know, you're going to need, um, you know, if you're hunting honkers, you're going to need a bunch of geese on the land and a bunch of geese on the ice and a bunch in the water. Then you might be hunting a little, you know, a, a spot where it's just a little, you know, a little hole that you've got open and you got a handful of decoys in there and, and that's what it takes. So a lot of different things to consider when you're setting those spreads, but in general, in my opinion, it's best to just downsize it just a little bit. And, um, that way it's a little more inviting and there's a little more room for the birds to come in. But, you know, there's a lot of different ways to approach that, Dan. What do you think? Yeah. You know, it's back to scouting. See what you see out there. If, if you can find some open holes, you know, you're going to see geese standing around. You're going to see the, a few ducks standing around, but a lot of ducks in the water swimming around and keeping it open. And you're going to see birds, that are sleeping. So, you know, if you have some sleeper shells, put those out there and, you know, have at it. Just go and keep it realistic. See what you're seeing during your scouting and, and try and do that. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the times you get your, your little beaver ponds and whatnot that you can bust open and, you know, just you have a great day. So I, I agree with you downsizing for the most part. Yeah, and, and the only time I've really hunted late season where I've used lots of numbers is is when hunting Canada geese. And, you know, a lot of times what I'm doing there is I'm putting out a bunch of sleeper shells, that kind of stuff, just to add that number and look create like a loafing situation. Uh, because I don't I don't really use sleeper shells at all throughout the year until it gets late. And usually my sleeper shells are gonna be set around the ice hole that we have open, um, that kind of scenario. So that's about the only time I'm going to use a bigger spread, but again, that's my my particular situation here. It could vary where you where you're at, and that's where the scouting piece comes in to know what you, what you know what's going on in your area. One thing that true. I true and go ahead. I was just going to say with with the you know we are t- talking about a deep freeze here, so make sure that your decoys are tight together. That you know that is a key. You're not going to see if you scout anywhere that everything's frozen over. You're not going to see birds just scattered out with you know, 10 yards, 10, 15 yards between all of them, like they're going to be huddled up. So, you know, keep an eye on that. Yep. I was going out the other morning, um, and it was cold and, um, I was going across the river in my canoe and, uh, you know, I'm sitting there and I can see this dark mass on the, on the water up ahead of us. And honest to God, I thought it was a log that was just floating there that we were going to have to go around. And we got really close to it and then just a knot of coots took off and just busted out of there. And I mean, I'm talking several thousand probably, but you oh know, we hunt a, you know, a tidal river that, you know, if you get a heavy rain or something and the water levels come up, you'll get floating, you know, logs and stuff coming up and down. And I just thought it was a log floating out there in the middle. Uh, they were that packed. I mean, it was that tight. So, uh, you know, yeah. Definitely spacing is, is more important in the late in late part of the year. Um, another thing that's important for me in, in this time of year is is calling. And um, I tend to subscribe in general to less is more. Um, I've learned hunting in just pressured areas. You know, where we hunt, there's a blind every 500 yards on the bank. And when there's people in all those blinds, if you see a flock of mallards, you know, flying, every single blind 
that they pass just, you know, cuts a contest routine at them every time. And it's just, you know, they hear that all the way up and down the flyway. So in, in at least in the pressured areas that I'm hunting, if you think that you're just going to turn a, a knot of ducks on a hail call and they're just going to come, you know, drop into your spread with after with a few feeding chuckles after that you're just flat out wrong that's just not going to happen now if you're hunting some private ground or less pressured birds of course that's going to be more effective but where we hunt that stuff tends to do more harm than good in my experience so i tend to really back off the calling um some of my best call most responsive birds to calling oddly enough have been some of the diver ducks that kind of come um you know in for example, the canvas back that I shot a couple months, you know, back in November, that flock circled us three times and was turned and flew away. And I just, you know, I threw a hail call just to see if I could turn them and they turned right back around and that next pass, they dropped into the decoys. That was just a hail Mary. Like it's, it's clear that they're gone. I've got nothing to lose type of scenario. So I will do that on occasion. But if I see birds come into the spread, I'm trying to use my decoys and the motion in my spread as a visual call versus me blowing on that you know duck call and trying to make them work uh like i said they've been flying all season long getting called to and shot at so they're kind of hip to the game at this point so in my opinion if you're hunting in pressured situations sometimes it's best to leave the call in your pocket and uh you know try to use the visual call motion in your decoys jerk rigs that kind of stuff to get them to turn um you know dan you you, you can't use mojos and you know, motorized decoys up there. So what are some of the things that you use when, when the call is not as effective? I go with the jerk rig for sure, but I'm just, you know, as I was listening to you talk there, I, it just takes me back, you know, thinking this is a deep freeze situation. A lot of guys in the North, you know, we're not talking about Texas that it's wide open all the time. So going back to our, our interview with Sean Stahl, you know, he's, when he's saying that the birds are stressed, you know, they're going to do things that they don't usually do. And, you know, we were talking about that, the hunt that we limited out six guys, there's snow on the ground. Those birds, we didn't have to call at all. And they were going to come in and they needed to eat, you know, they wanted to feed and there wasn't anything stopping them. So when it's late season and, you know, I know we're going to talk about, you know, sleeping in a little bit, but you know, they're going to get up at a specific time and they're not going to waste energy flying from field to field to check on things. So if you have your decoys set right and they know that they're feeding there and they're going to waste less energy if they just drop in, you know, with, with honkers, keep a, you know, consistent tune going, but you don't need to, to really blow them out of the water. So they're going to be coming no matter what, most of the time. Yeah. That's always the case. If you're on the X, I mean, you know, most of the time you can, you don't really need to call a ton, but, uh, you know, just kind of circling back full circle on this point here. Um, a lot of times, you know, you're going to do yourself more harm than good. If you're just wailing on the call, especially if you're doing it and birds aren't responding, don't keep doing it. You know, they're not, they're not just going to all of a sudden love what they're hearing and, uh, and react more positively. So really all you're going to do is just educate those birds even further. Um, something else that I think that's really important when it gets to be the late time of the year, um, don't overlook previously unproductive spots. So what I mean by that is. You know, if there's a creek that you drive by every day and you never see birds in it all season long, don't just take it for granted that in the late season when things start freeze up that that creek's not any good either because that creek might be a runoff, uh, you know, situation where the water levels pick up a little bit and it keeps the water open uh, longer into the year. When things start freezing up, they got to go to water. So those types of situations might get more productive. Um, things that you want to consider, you know, feeder creeks. You might have a lake that's froze over but there's a creek that feeds into that back in a little corner and it keeps a little piece of water open because the water that's trickling into there, um, you know, those kinds of spots can be just absolutely dynamite. Um, they will huddle around the smallest little piece of water just because that's all that they can find. Um, you know, floating rivers at this time of year can be just outstanding hunting. Um, you know, if you've got running water, birds typically might not like to be in the, you know, the running water if they have other options, but late in the year, they might just, you know, drop down in behind a lay down that gives the water a little bit of break in the current where they can relax a little bit more or a little sandbar that they can stand on and just, you know, jump in and jump out of the water, that kind of stuff. Those situations can be great. Um, a lot of refuges and, and, you know, places that you can't hunt have, you know, streams and creeks and things that run along the boundaries of them, that sort of thing. 
you know, pay close attention to those areas. Um, you know, if you can get in a canoe or something like that and safely navigate some of those waters, you might have birds that are just dropped down in these little pockets that you'd never really considered before, hadn't ever been productive in the past. So don't overlook things that, um, you know, just because that's the way it's always been when it gets cold and things lock up, the game changes and they get desperate. So, you know, the birds that are in the area, they're going to be looking for something. Um, what do you think, Dan? You ever uh, run into a situation like that? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, uh, you, you were talking about feeder streams, but any of the lakes that have any type of dam, you know, that water comes from from underneath, so that's not frozen. So any kind of outflow is usually going to be open. And in late season around here, if you can find some outflows, you're going to find birds. Like that's a that's a little little tip for any locals for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Running water is a good thing late time of year. If you can find it or you know where some is, regardless of how, you know, how you've never seen a duck there in the past, it's worth your time to just run by there and take a look because you never know. Um, you know, you mentioned weather and, you know, adding stress into the, the lives of birds. Another weather event to sort of keep in mind is the thaw days. You know, you get those warm days once in a while. You know, you've had a snap of cold air and it's just been locked down, froze. And then you get a stretch of a day or two where it's warm and things thaw out a little bit. You know, birds are just like us. You know, it's like almost almost how it feels after a winter and you get that first day of like kind of warm temperatures and it feels better and you're outside and you're like, man, this feels not too bad. And birds the same way. They'll, they'll get up, they'll fly around, they're looking for new opportunities for feed and water and that kind of stuff. So those thaw days can be just great hunting. And But like Dan said, any kind of change in weather is definitely something that you should have on your radar when it gets to this time of year, you know, something that can either add stress into a bird's life or change their pattern of behavior. Uh, all that stuff is just super important to pay attention to, you know, this time of year and, uh, and to take advantage of quite frankly. So, yeah, I was going to say, in, in addition to the thaw days, go out when it's really, really windy. And why, why would I say go out when it's windy? Well, the birds don't want to be in the middle of a lake, so they're going to be skirting, you know, the sides. If you can break some ice and it keeps them out of the wind, you break ice and get get your little setup there, you could have a really successful hunt. And also, I mean, if if it is really windy, you know, the wind and it starts chopping the water up, it's going to break the ice up too. So it might not reach you, but uh, if it gets super choppy, then they're going to be getting off that water. Yeah. Wind is a, wind is a hunter's best friend. There's no question a duck hunter's best friend. And especially when it's cold, it can help you out a lot. Uh, makes it tough to be out there sometimes, but it's definitely beneficial uh, for us as hunters. Um, you know, you you hinted at this already, but when it's cold, um, really cold, you know, birds are conserving energy. They're in survival mode. Um, they may not fly every single day if they uh, if they can, uh, you know, survive and, and conserve energy. But if they are going to fly, tends to be later in the day, the warmest part of the day. And they want to be as efficient with their energy as possible. They're going to lift up. They're going to go to the feed and they're going to come back. So they're not going to be out just cruising first light, that kind of stuff like you mentioned. So scouting really is important to know when the birds are going to fly. And a lot of times it's not going to be a little bit lit till later in the day. So you can sleep in, um, you know, and you don't always have to be out there in the super cold temperatures first thing in the morning. Uh, we learned that on a hunt last February where it was brutally cold and, you know, single digit temperatures and the birds actually didn't end up flying that day, but they had flown the day before. Um, and we went down after the hunt and we took a look and the birds were sitting right there on the roost where they'd been all day long and they never, never flew during daylight hours. So, you know, um, that was something that, the, you know, it just changed overnight from what the scouting was the day before, but you know, you're going to have that. But most of the time, you know, when you know that the birds are flying, if they're flying once a day and it's later in the afternoon, you can kind of pinpoint that time and maximize your uh, opportunities for success. Yeah, definitely the scouting during your lunch break comes into effect now as well because if you go around in the morning, like you said, they're going to be on a roost and it might not be till 11 or 12 that they get up and, and start feeding. And that was a very, very cold day that we were out there. That was chilly for sure. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of frozen beards and... um you know, a lot of shenanigans going on out in the blinds to pass the time that day. But And speaking, I wanted to talk about that a little more, too. I was reading a thing that um, Tony Vandemore actually was talking about, and he'll actually, you know, he'll go out and hunt during the midday, but then he shuts it down about an hour before dark, and 
the reason he does that is so they continue to go to that field to feed. You know, they might not have got up midday, but they're going out in the evening to feed. Well, the next day they might be getting there a little earlier. But, I mean, he is he's a very different situation, too. You know, he has probably 3,000 acres of flooded corn, so he has a little more leeway. But if you have a good flyway and a lot of birds around, that's something to think about. You don't want to blow them all out of there on one hunt. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Not everyone has, obviously, the situation that they have at Habitat Flats, but... Um, you know, there's, there's part of that theory that you can apply to your hunting situation. I'm sure. And, you know, it's all about maximizing the resource and, you know, getting the most out of it that you can. Uh, a couple other things, just sort of housekeeping kind of wrap up things for this segment is, um, you know, dress for the conditions. If you know, you're going to be in really cold weather and wind and that kind of stuff, make sure you're dressing appropriately. Um, you know, it's a, it'd be a bummer to get out there and, get too cold then you have to leave and the birds fly you know and you you put all the work to be there and you just didn't dress right so you know we talked about the importance of layering and um you know dressing appropriately for the field but uh you know i think that's one of the most uh, important things dan i mean you can never be too warm late season i mean you, you got to stay warm and you know when you get cold it tends to you know kind of go downhill quickly in the late season especially you got a wind something like that you know it can it can get cold pretty quick yeah when you're talking single digits and then 20 mile an hour winds i mean it's it's just common sense dress appropriately and and try and stay dry for sure yeah you know make sure make sure your waders don't have any holes in them <laughs> um you know that might fill up your left boot hey, sp- uh, sp- speaking know, of just... that we're we're going on our maryland hunt here pretty soon and last i knew you had a couple holes in your waders so what's the what's the current situation there yeah i did i had um well actually take a let me pause the discussion on on the the late season the freeze hunt here um a couple weeks ago about a week and a half ago i took my first ever swim in the morning um was you know as i mentioned hunting the river setting decoys and there was just a a a massive tree underwater um i mean this thing's like a freaking sequoia or something i mean just a monster right and i'm pitching decoys out and i throw the decoy and i stumble into the tree on my left foot so i'm falling forward but i you know it's a it's a slow fall graceful so i can I would normally bring my right leg up and catch myself. Well, when I brought my right leg up, I basically just need the side of the sequoia tree and just <laughs> flopped over the side of it. And, um, fortunately enough, it was, it wasn't, I had my life jacket on still. So that helped me. And I just kind of bounced my hands off the bottom and just popped right back up immediately. But it was, uh, deep enough to come down the front of my waders a little bit and all the way down to my feet. So I was cold and wet all the way down. So, you know, I continued to, we, you know, I continued to hunt. Um, and I don't know some of the moisture that I was seeing from there might've been residual. Cause I don't know if my waders got completely dried out after that before the next morning type of thing. But I think I identified about three leaks in my waders out of nowhere, just popped up. So I, um, I bought some, some sealer and I sealed my waders inside and out on along all the seams, all the way up and down the legs, through the crotch area, all that. So hunted the other day, pretty sure I stayed dry. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about where I'm at with my waiter patch right now, but, uh, yeah, it was fortunately enough that day. It wasn't too cold because I, I could have been in, in big trouble and would have cut my hunt really short. And actually that that's, uh, one of the other things that I wanted to mention about hunting in the cold weather is just don't take your safety for granted. Um, if you're in a situation like I was where you get wet and you're talking single digit temperatures or something like that, um, I mean, you're pretty much in trouble right now. I mean, you need, you know, if you get wet, the the time is not in your favor. You need to get warm, get out of wet clothes. So I've said it before on the show and I will say it again. Just have a plan in mind, whether you hunt on a John boat and a canoe, you wade in, whatever it is. If you get wet, have a plan on what you're going to do. The time to devise a plan is not after you're soaking wet and shivering. So just think that through a little bit before you, uh, you know, get after it with this, uh, this late season stuff and, you know, common sense. If you're in deeper water, be very careful with ice. You don't want to be walking on it, all that kind of stuff. So just some common sense goes a long way, but always have a plan. That's kind of where I stand there. Yeah. And like, you know, we we're saying that in a, in a late, late freeze, the birds aren't going to move till late. You really have no reason to be 
breaking ice in a canoe or a really small boat in the dark. Like you could probably wait until it's starting to get light out and start breaking ice to get out and uh, get your setup on. So three things I want to mention here as we close out this discussion. Um, one, stay concealed this time of year. Super important. Maybe as important as at any point in the year. Like I said, these birds have been shot at. They've been called to. They've been hunted. They've seen all kinds of decoys. They've seen all kinds of lumps in the fields with decoys around them. So they're they're smart to these things. Concealment is is just critically critically important two if you're hunting cold temperatures remember if you're not the only one out there if you've got a dog with you make sure your dog's safe don't be sending your dog out over thin ice pay attention to your dog make sure you've got food things to keep them warm if they're you know put the uh neoprene jacket on them that kind of stuff um just be very careful watch watch their paws watch for cuts from ice that kind of stuff and then um I won't elaborate on this too much. I, I'm sure Dan has more than enough knowledge, but um, keep your gun clean, cold weather, dirty guns, bad idea. That's just kind of where I'll leave that. What, what do you think, Dan? Uh, when's a parting <laughs> shot coming up? <laughs> it's been a rough episode for, for Dan. No, here. I, I bring that up because it was a, it, it, it's just the best experience that I've ever been in part of, of where the cold weather just completely debilitated your gun i mean it was i don't even know if it was a single shot could you even rack the slide i can't remember it <laughs> it was uh questionable at best yeah and that was the day that we hunted the eight degree you know it was eight degrees and it was cold and you know you're that that year you hadn't cleaned your gun like all season i don't believe and it just seized right up on you and basically was not functional so um a very good lesson learned and fortunately enough birds didn't fly and we didn't have to shoot without you but um, you know, and obviously you've hunted with Kimber in some cold situations and stuff too. So, you know, you know more about that probably than I do. Yeah. Usually, you know, the neoprene will definitely keep them warm, but like you were saying with the ice, just make sure, you're... I mean, it's a family member. If it's something that is really marginal, you don't want to send your dog out and have your dog not come back. So, I mean, I, I think we're preaching to the choir a little bit. I think guys are smarter than that, but, um, you know, just it's something to always be mindful about. Yeah. Well, that's kind of uh, our short and long of hunting the hard freeze and what to do when things start locking up. I know that we didn't cover every kind of situation. You know, if you're hunting flooded timber, you're dealing with a different ball game. If you're hunting, you know, various uh, open water scenarios, it's a little bit different. So uh, if you've got anything else that you'd like to add to the discussion, to the discussion, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'd be more than happy to, um, you know, hear what you have to say and, uh, and uh, have you part of the discussion. So anything else, Dan, um, about hunting the late freeze that you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Grow a beard if you can. Like I know you can grow a, about 10 inches worth of beard in about three days, but if you have to plan for that, like myself, make sure you plan for it. And uh, yeah, just, I mean, be safe and have fun. It's it's what it's all about. And it's just the same kind of hunting. It, it can just get very scary a lot quicker during this time period without a doubt without question so okay let's go ahead and uh move on to the end of the show so dan before we get into the parting shot i'd like to give you an opportunity to bring up anything that maybe you wanted to discuss in the show that we haven't had a chance to do or uh you know, anything that you'd like to add before we just kind of put a bow on this puppy for this week? Um, yeah, I think one of the things I'm trying to do this year, I'm talking about New Year's resolutions still, but just trying to stay very positive and positive attitudes. And, you know, we're doing this to try and help people. And I think it's just very sad that, you know, there's a lot of Facebook groups out there that guys are trying to get knowledge and people just tear them apart. And it's the total opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. And it really just makes me sad. And it it's no wonder why waterfowl hunting numbers are going down. Like some people are just ruthless and there's really no need for it. Like, I don't know if it just makes you feel like that much more of a man or, or what you're trying to accomplish with it. But, you know, it's just really unnecessary. And, I, you know, I wish it would stop because it's just it's embarrassing if someone as a non hunter would see that or read that. You know, it's really interesting that you bring that you bring this up. And 
we didn't talk about this before the show at all. Um, I was browsing a, 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 you know, a duck hunting forum that I will not name. And, um, there was a, an individual that had posted a comment about being new to an area and, um, was trying to hunt a couple different spots and was just asking for some general kind of information. And, people just blasted him on there and I get not putting your spots online and, you know, being protective of stuff that you scouted and stuff like that. But you know, these were, these were well-known spots. I mean, this guy was obviously just trying to get out, but, um, I thought the same thing. I mean, I was like, you know, who are these guys just blasting this guy, you know, this guy who's just asking a general question. And I felt really bad for him because, uh, as anybody out here knows that he's either started waterfowl hunting recently or, you know, doing it on their own, um, it can be really tough. And, you know, I, I reflected back to, uh, you know, a couple episodes ago when I asked about, you know, some feedback for fly fishing. And I mean, I've just got tons of information from everybody that listens to the show and, uh, all of you, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I just feel really fortunate to have, you know, the ability to get good information and kind of get pointed in the right direction. And, you know, again, I hope, uh, like you said, I hope that this show provides some guys an outlet about how to get going and how to get started. And obviously we can't point everybody into the, the right spot or the right public land, that kind of thing. But we like to try to at least help you out because just like everybody else, we were in the same boat. You know what I mean? We all start from somewhere and we don't all have, you know, a mentor to show us the ropes and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I'm with you, man. I wish, I wish a lot of that stuff would go away, but, um, unfortunately I don't, I don't see that happening. And, uh, you know, I think that's just sort of part of the culture to some degree, but it is unfortunate. I'll, I'll definitely agree with you there. Yep. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I was just reading it and it, I don't want to comment on it because I'd probably lose my coal really quick after they responded, but it's just, like I said, it's unnecessary and I just, gives anti hunters more ammunition. Like if we can't get along, then it's, it's embarrassing. It's just flat out embarrassing that there's guys like that. Always, always remember, you know, my mom used to always tell me as a little boy, uh, and regardless of what, what the situation is, whether you're duck hunting and the way you live your life, whatever, but just remember the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you, you know, and if someone's looking for a hand, be there to will, you know, to give them a hand because at some point, you know, you're going to need a hand and you're going to you know, be counting on somebody else too. So really great point, Dan. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, anything else? No, I think that was my little baby rant for the day. I'm good. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let me go ahead and uh, wrap this puppy with the uh, parting shot. This week's parting shot is basically a just a comment about a discussion that comes up a lot this time of year and it's about hunting seasons and moving the season back and not seeing birds and that kind of stuff and you know a lot of people talk about you know there's science that's showing that the migration tends to be later and um, everybody has an opinion on what it's going to take to have the most successful duck season you've heard Dan talk about a couple different times you know normally their season's gone in Pennsylvania by the time the divers show up real good and that kind of stuff and they don't have that opportunity to hunt them Um, I don't really know where I stand on this but One thing that I will say is that, you know, everyone that wants to take the time to write to your, you know, your state, um, you know, environmental agency and the people that make the seasons, make sure you do a little research before you, uh, you know, put your opinion out there as far as what you want seasons to be. There's a lot of bad information about out there. And if you're a guy that just doesn't put in the time, you know, there might be birds out there that you're missing. So make sure you're giving everything a good look around and doing your part to make sure that, you know, the seasons aren't okay and, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So think about that when you're talking and when you hear people talking about um, when seasons should be and how the migration is and that kind of stuff. It's a complicated discussion and definitely one that deserves to be looked into. All right, that does it for episode 19 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our profile, the American Widgeon, and our discussion on uh, hunting the late freeze. We'd like to thank uh, Justin Mullins for uh, giving us the listener HP question of the week. And if you would like to do so, please feel to call us. Feel free to call us at 724-609-3695. We look forward to bringing you more episodes next week. And uh, hopefully we get some of that late cold weather that we can all hunt uh, here at the end of the season. So for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care.